The story of Ruth is a story of challenge, loyalty, faith, character, and God's blessing. I don't think you're hearing me clearly. This book right here, the book of Ruth, gives a short glimpse of their lives. And through it, we see amazing virtues of faith, submission, hard work, gratitude, and humility. And in the end of it all, through the highs and lows, we watch as God's hand redeems those who follow him and heals the lives of the brokenhearted. So get ready for this amazing journey with God through the book of Ruth, because it's bigger than you think. Making Christ known is about expressing the life and the love and the power of Jesus in everyday life. You and I are called for such a time as this. Jesus always says, come before he says go. God has got more for us. Let's embrace it together. Join us for the City on Hill Summit, 23 and 24 October, at a site near you. God has got an appointment with you. Don't miss out. Welcome to our online celebration, friends. I believe that God has got an appointment with you today. And it's really, really amazing for us to have you. We've been opening up. We've opened up uh, uh, in-person celebrations. Our life groups are open during the week. God is doing some awesome stuff. We've got such an expectation. But this morning, we've got a special blessing all the way from Australia. We've got Paul Collinson that will be sharing the word. He's on Tyrant's team with us. Uh, he leads Extreme Life Church. And they're an amazing, just an amazing family, an amazing church. Great friends of City on Hill. Uh, I, honestly, I just love Paul Collins and he preached at our equip recently. Absolutely powerful. I'm telling you, friends, this guy really carries something beautiful and I love his heart. I love his biblical understanding. And so this morning, I want to ask you, open your heart wide, receive from God. And, and if you're in, le in leadership or in the core of City on Hill, I want to ask you to really take notes and to make the most of this. Also, some of you might be sitting there saying, I'd like to give. If you'd like to give, our details are on the screen. You'd be able to be part of that. But let's open our hearts. Let's receive what God's got for us because God wants to do something awesome in your life. Bless you and enjoy. Mark, Marie and the team there at City on a Hill, thank you guys so much for this lovely opportunity to preach with you guys, for you guys. Uh, obviously, uh, I know that we don't give our pulpits away particularly easily, so I don't take this opportunity for granted. I really appreciate it. And look, I'm not going to say too much in the way of introduction because I've got a lot to get through in this message. So can I just say, sit down, strap in, get ready. Here we go. All right. Thanks again, guys. We're going to get straight into 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 20 to 26 today. We're going to have a, a, a read through, then we're going to have a dig through. We're going to do a little bit of cross-referencing and checking and, and align a few things and tie a few passages in. And hopefully I can do this all within a uh, short space of time and we can get somewhere positive quickly. So here we go. Let's read this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, picking up in verse 20. It says, Now in a great house, and the reason we're starting here today for you guys is because I totally believe in the prophetic that in your local church, God is building a great house. Now, in your great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. All right, so in your great house. We know that I'm not stretching the context there at all because Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15, he identified very clearly that the household of God is the church of God. And you guys are part of the church of God. So Paul's illustration is of the church being a house. Uh, It describes the characteristics that make a house a great house. So we can glean from this some of the characteristics, some of the things we need to implement if we're not going to just be a house, but we're going to be a great house. See, God's universal church is designed to be great. And I want to say to you today that your local church is destined to be a part of of that greatness. We are called to be a global, radiant, glorious bride without wrinkle, spot, stain or blemish. And the only way for that to become a reality in the practical outworking is through the cleaning up of all the houses that together make up God's house. That is the local churches that are part of the church, of which you are one of those parts. So your local church is a house that is a part of God's house on this planet. And you know what? God desires for your part in his house to be a great house. So we're going to have a look at some of those characteristics of what makes a house a great house, and hopefully we can implement them and grow together and all become great. Part of a great house is that it's a, a place where we can, uh, we can find our place to serve and to love and to be loved, where we can be accepted, where we can be cared for and where we can be nourished and where we can grow. And we're going to look at all of those in these next few verses. So Paul makes it very clear in this passage that uh, one factor of a house being great is is that it contains all kinds of vessels. He says that there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but there are also vessels of wood and clay. And some are for noble, uh, honorable use and some for dishonorable use. That's in verse 20. Now, if we link that to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 17, we know there that the, whatever house we're part of, whatever house we're building, whatever kind of vessel we are, the important thing is, first and foremost, that Jesus Christ is the only foundation that any house can be built on successfully. So we need to establish right up front that the foundation that we're building on is Jesus Christ. Then, once that's established, once we've got that in place, then we need to determine what kind of vessel am I going to be within this house? That regardless of what kind of vessel I am, the house I'm part of is going to be a great house. But if you're anything like me, the desires in me say, well, I don't want to be an average or less than average part of a great house. I want to be in a great house, but I want to be a great part of the great house. And that's what this passage is helping us with. So again, in 1 Corinthians 3, it tells us that Jesus is the foundation we build on, but that we need to choose whether we're going to build with gold and silver or precious stones or with wood, hay or straw. 
What it also tells us there is that everything we build will be tested and it gives us an incredible heads up and advantage because way before the test, it tells us what kind of test it's going to be. And the test is going to be fire. Now, if we know anything about fire and wood and hay and straw, we're probably smart enough to know that those aren't going to be building materials that withstand the intense testing of fire. If we have the alternative of building with gold and silver and precious stones, then those are going to be the things that withstand the testing that comes by fire. So we need to choose to build with gold and silver and precious stones rather than building with wood or hay or straw. Because only what survives the fire will be rewarded. Now we also know from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 that this temple of God, this church of God, this house of God that's being built, that we are that temple. And he says that God's temple is holy. So if we are a living, active part of the temple that God is building, then we need to be holy like he is holy. Now, that's not a disqualifying statement in any way, shape or form. Because here in 2 Timothy, Paul lets us know that a great house is great because it doesn't only consist of gold and silver vessels. See, there's room in a great house for the wood and the hay and the, uh, he says in that passage, clay. He, th there's room for the wood and the clay vessels as well. What does that mean? If we should be gold and silver, why is there room for these other ones? Because it is a redemptive house. Part of being a great house is that we are a redemptive house. We are a house of restoration. So, all are welcome. Anyone can come in, whether they be gold or silver or whether they be wood or clay, whether they're hay or straw. It makes no difference. If we're going to be a great house, everybody is welcome to be part of our great house. It does, however, tell us that we get to choose which kind of part of that great house we're going to be. So, if we, we welcome everybody, that's redemption. But restoration means everybody has the opportunity to become a vessel for honourable use. So how do we transition from being wood or clay or whatever we are? How do we transition from that to being gold or silver? How do we transition from being a vessel for dishonourable use to a vessel for honourable use? That is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. And verse 21 introduces us to the answer. It says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonourable, he will be a vessel for honourable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So to be a great house, we've got to have room and the willingness to accept and embrace all kinds of vessels. But not all kinds of vessels that are contained should be ordained. So the ordained vessels, the, the honourable use, may require a little bit of personal cleaning up in our own lives. If we want to transition from dishonourable to honourable, there might be some things we need to address in our own lives. It says there that we need to cleanse ourselves from what is dishonourable. Now, if we jump across to Colossians 3, in verses 5 to 11, we see uh, something of a list of things that the, what are the, the Bible calls dishonourable. So these would be the kinds of things that we need to clean up from our lives. Let me just skim over this list quickly because this is not a, a, an ideal list of things that we want to cultivate. This is the list of things we want to get rid of, so let's not focus on it too long. 
sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lying, unforgiveness, complaining, and entitlement. Now, some of those things are quite common in modern culture and society around us. But the Bible calls those things, the, those are the, 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 the list of things that are dishonorable. We need to get rid of those things. We see a similar uh, list, uh, 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 the, the same kind of picture being painted in Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. The list there is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So it's not an exhaustive list. It's a outline list and things like them. So that, that's a helpful guide for the kinds of things we need to be dealing with, getting rid of. In the passage we're looking at in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22 tells us to flee our youthful passions. And previously in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, uh, Paul clarified what some of those youthful passions might be. He says, lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Now, through those lists, we can see a very clear and concise and consistent picture of what the Bible considers to be dishonorable characteristics. So if we want to be vessels of honor, we must first cleanse ourselves from this list of things that the Bible calls dishonorable. It's actually just part of our growing up, our maturing. And in our growing up and our maturing, it's vital that at some point we learn to take responsibility for dealing with any ungodliness, anything dishonorable that emerges in our own lives. We've got to keep in mind that James tells us the Word of God is a mirror. And in a mirror, we look at ourselves. It is not a window. So we don't use it as a window to look at others. We use it as a mirror to look at ourselves. We take responsibility for dealing with our own lack of cleanliness, our own ungodliness, the dishonorable characteristics in our own lives first. That's where it starts, taking responsibility for ourselves. Now, we see this in the natural world as well. I mean, part of growing up, uh, when we're born as little babies, we don't take responsibility for anything. If we want food, we squawk. If we're finished with our food and we've processed it and deposited it, we squawk. If we're cold, if we're tired, in fact, if we have any kind of need, our solution as babies is to just squawk about it. Let someone else know how unhappy we are. That's what babies do. As we mature, instead of squawking about it, we take responsibility for it and we put a solution in place. So when we're hungry, we don't squawk, we find some food. <laughs> and when we're finished with it, we deposit it a little more healthy way than just in our own pants, right? Because we're mature and we're taking responsibility. It's called maturing. It's called growing up. And God expects that of us in our spiritual lives and our spiritual development as well as in our physical lives. You know, our maturity, our growing up in this spiritual context is so important to Jesus. It is so valuable to Jesus that he actually gave gifts to the church to help us grow up into maturity. Now, we can read all about that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. It says there that he gave some gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists. He gave those gifts to the church 
to help the church grow to maturity. And it gives us a, a, a quick description of the kind of maturity we should be aiming for. It talks about not just maturity in general terms, but a unity of the faith and of the knowledge of Christ. So we should have a common unity of the faith and a common unity in our knowledge of Christ. We should be reaching mature manhood. It goes on uh, as if that's not hard enough already. It goes on and says that the measure of the maturity that we should be aiming for is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't know about you, but some days I feel more mature than others. But I've never had a day where I've thought, gee, I've reached the fullness, the, the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Which means I've still got some maturing to do. I've still got some of this process to go through. It says, no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So mature believers, we're not getting led astray by all these new ideas and new teaching and different emphasis that all come. You know, the emphases in the global church seems to change every five or ten minutes. But we don't get caught up in every emphasis. The main thing is the main thing and we keep on with the task. Why? Because we are mature and we're not blown around by all these doctrinal winds. It tells us to grow up into Christ. There it is again. What's our goal? Christ. What are we trying to mature into? Christ. How do we know when we've grown up? Christ. We should be, we are in the process of transformation and we are being transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. That is what it's to be mature. What is to be like Christ is to be mature. So we're in this process of growing up and maturing. So we see a picture of this conversion and maturation process in the life of Saul, who became Paul, in the book of Acts in chapter 9, and it's paralleled with Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. Now, in Acts chapter 9, we read all about the conversion of Saul, and then it goes on and says, and then he's preaching. So one moment he's the persecutor, next moment he's the preacher. But as you guys know, because you've done a series in Acts and you've unpacked it all, it's, it's not a chronological listing. It's a highlight reel and there's some gaps. And it, it, it didn't, he wasn't the persecutor on one day and the preacher on the next, but somewhere around Acts 9, verse 20, 22, somewhere there, there's a gap of about three years. And it's that gap that we read about in Galatians 1. And in that gap in Galatians 1, 15 to 23, we see some keys uh, as to how this maturing process can happen. So the first thing it says in there is that it's God who sets us apart before we were even born. And I want to say to you today, wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, wherever you're dialed in, God set you apart before you were even born. It goes on and says that he called us by his grace. And I want to tell you, you are called by God's grace. The fact that you were born means that you were set apart before you were born. And the fact that you were set apart before you were born proves that you were called by His grace. God had a purpose and a plan for you that if He didn't have, you would never have been born. The reason we were born was so that we could become what He'd set, uh, what He'd called us to be, what He'd set us apart to be, so that we could become His intended design and work with him in his intended purpose for our lives. So the fact that we exist proves that we were set apart and that we were called. The next step that Saul went through was God revealed his son to him. Now we know for Saul that meant he got knocked off a horse and taken out and spent some days on the ground and blind and all of that. We might not go through something quite that dramatic, 
But any conversion is dramatic because our whole entire future changes in the moment we accept the gift of salvation through Christ. So God reveals his son to us and we hand our lives to him. Now, that means we've got to have our own revelation of Christ. God has to reveal his son to us personally. We, we don't get saved by somebody else's revelation of Christ. We get saved by our own personal revelation of Christ. Then the next phase, he says that he, uh, pr- the purpose of that is so he can preach Jesus to others. But before he transitions into preaching Jesus to others, it says that he got taken, he got led by the Spirit into Arabia, And he went through a maturing process there in Arabia. Isn't it interesting that that was something of an isolation, which I guess for you guys, similar to us over here in Victoria, we're in a lockdown of sorts here. You can see the the building around me is empty. There's nobody here to be enjoying this message. So I hope you are. But in these times of lockdown, it's something of an isolation. So I would encourage us to take hold of this time of isolation and make sure that it's it's not a time where we just withdraw from everyone and everything and become uh, depressed and anxious and slip into that cycle of life, but rather we allow our isolation to be a, a time where we grow in our experience of Jesus and our revelation of Jesus. And then, like for Saul, God can use that isolation with revelation to use that in our preparation and our maturation which then after the end of that process we can step into our application it says in Galatians there that that isolation time for Saul was about three years so after three years of this revelation in isolation in this maturation through preparation then he was able to step into his application. I also find it interesting that if we research into where this uh, wilderness in Arabia is, it's actually around the base of Mount Sinai. So God in his incredible planning and orchestration takes Saul to the very same place where many years earlier he'd taken Moses. And in that place, God gave Moses a revelation of his perfect law. But at that very same place, God chooses to give Saul a revelation of his perfect grace. Right there in the same geographical location. All right, moving on. So the context also established in 2 Timothy 2, a little earlier than where we picked up, talks about the the dishonorable content that's handed to us by the irreverent babblers. Uh, It it talks about that in the the few preceding verses. And what we can glean from that is that not only should we not be irreverent babblers, talking nonsense all the time, and some of that nonsense is described as, you know, it's sowing disunity and uh, attacking our leaders and speaking ill of others, like all of that stuff, completely unhelpful. And what this is letting us know is don't just not be the ones doing it, but make sure we're also not even listening to it. Because when people are talking this stuff in our ears, some of it sticks. And we get this thing called secondhand offense. And secondhand offense stops us from becoming mature believers. It stops us transitioning from dishonorable into honorable. We've got to get ourselves clean of this stuff. And you know what? When people, if people ever start to have these conversations around us, we actually just need to, for the sake of our maturity and for the sake of the body of Christ, we need to say, can you stop, please? I don't want to hear gossip. I don't want to hear slander. I don't want to hear my leaders being shot down. I don't want to hear about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. If, let's talk about Jesus or let's talk about me. Let's talk about you. Let's keep it serious. Let's not speculate. Let's not get caught up in drama and issues. and uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's keep it pure so we can grow and we can mature 
And let's keep some of this filth off of our lives, out of our ears and out of our hearts. This is part of becoming mature believers. All right, so it says that God set us apart. Remember in Galatians, God set us apart before we were born. But now here we're encouraged to set ourselves apart after we've been born. Keep ourselves separate from all of the rubbish that can get into our lives, get into our hearts, get into our minds and defile us and cause us to stay dishonorable. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 15, uh, we get this bit of a battle plan <laughs> outlined there. So I'll just skim over that quickly. It says, prepare your minds for action. You know, we get to determine what rattles around in these minds of ours. So we need to put some things out. We need to take some thoughts captive in Corinthians. We need to put some things aside and prepare and focus and choose the good things to be in our minds. It says be sober minded, which means have control of what is rattling around in our heads. It says set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're growing in that revelation, growing in our experience of grace and our understanding of grace. And grace, Jesus Christ, is the person of grace. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. See, before we knew Christ, before we had a personal revelation and encounter and experience of Christ, we were ignorant. We didn't know that some of those things in some of those lists were bad. They used to feel good. But once we know Christ, those things aren't good anymore. They're dishonorable and they keep us immature and ineffective. If we want to be mature and effective and ready for honorable use we've got to put those things aside the first place we put them aside is in our thinking in our minds in our mentality we don't think on those things anymore we change our focus sober-minded as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all of your conduct and that's letting us know there and that uh, prepare your minds, be sober minded. It's telling us that where we think is where we will act. And we don't change our conduct without first changing our thinking. So change the way we think about those things will then work its way through our lives to how we behave with regard to those things. And then this is what enables us to be useful to the master of the house, as it said in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now we see that word useful a few times in the New Testament. I'm always looking for the, the same thing appearing in different places, okay? Because we can correlate them and see what does it really mean? What is it trying to tell us? There's a bigger picture than just the odd word here and there. So we see this word useful in Philemon verse 11. There was a, a dude there called Onesimus and he was not useful. But it says now he is useful and it tells us that what had changed was he'd caught Paul's heart and was now serving alongside of Paul. We also see it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, where Mark, who was not useful before, is useful again. In fact, he had been useful, then he became not useful, then he became useful again. What was it that transitioned him from being useful to not useful to being useful again? It was exactly this process we're talking about today. He, in this process of maturation and growth, he had caught Paul's heart and was now serving alongside of Paul and, and, and Paul's team and he was helping them to be efficient and effective in getting the job done well. So we can draw from that and say, well, there's a goal. We are to ensure that we are ready for every good work. Now, this is one of those contentious statements in the modern church. Every good work. Are we supposed to do any work? Hasn't Jesus done all the work? This, uh, well, you know what? With regard to our salvation, yes, Jesus has done all the work. We cannot work to earn, or achieve or acquire our salvation. It is a free gift through Christ. And once we receive the gift, then there's some work to do. Not to earn it, not 
because of it. It's just the fruit of it. We do the work because we got saved. We, how does that happen? Well, because we're being transformed into the image and likeness of Christ, which means we now pick up the mandate and the mission of Christ and we give ourselves to doing the work that Christ gave himself to doing. So it's not to earn it, it's because of it. It's a result of our salvation. In Titus chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, it says that the defiled profess to know God. So they claim to know God but they deny him by their works. So with their mouths, they say they know God, but with their bodies, with their actions, with the things they do, they're denying God. And it says that they are detestable. They are disobedient. They are unfit for any good work. Dishonorable. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works works what are we saved for good works once we are saved there's work to do there's partnership to participate in there's things to get on with in philippians 2 verses 12 to 13 it says for it is god who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure So that's letting us know that the will and the work, so the thinking and the doing, God wants to impact our thinking, which we read about before in 1 Peter. He wants to impact our thinking so that that can impact our doing. And he wants to align us with what he is doing. And then because of his grace, we can get on board in partnership and we can join him in doing what he is doing and we can see the world reached and impacted by the gospel of Christ. You can read more about these good works in Titus chapter 2 verse 7 verse 14, chapter 3 verse 1 and 8 and 14. Go have a read of those, they're awesome. I'm going to keep moving down to verse 22. It says, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So we're fleeing a whole bunch of other things. Youthful passions, I think the the translation there in in the message says infantile indulgence. So fleeing our infantile indulgence, basically fleeing our immaturity, our sinful desires, our juvenile ambitions, our lusts, our selfish desires, all that stuff. We flee from those things. Now that word flee is exactly the same word that we see in Genesis chapter 39 verse 12 where Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. So the way that he just grabbed his robes, hoisted them up and ran out of that room. Why? Because sin was there waiting to pounce. So he hoisted up the robes and he took off. That is a description of how we are to flee from these desires in our lives. Just hook the robes up and get out of there. Run as fast as you possibly can and keep running till you're no longer anywhere near it. And then since you're running already... It says, now that you've started running, that's good, but now let's change focus. Instead of running away from that, let's now run towards some things. And it says there that we should chase, we should pursue, we should run after righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So we start running to get away, but then we focus on, now what, I am already running, so what do I run towards? I'm running towards righteousness, faith, love and peace we need to chase after those things consistently and continuously as hard and as fast as we can we need to understand though that we can't take hold of all of those things on our own in isolation which is why it says along with those who call on the lord from a pure heart So what that's telling us, if we want to grow, if we want to mature, if we want to see those things outworked in our lives, then we need to be in a healthy, functioning part of the body of Christ, surrounded by brothers and sisters who are also fleeing and pursuing. We're encouraged to be around those who are people of prayer. It says those that are calling on the name of the Lord. So people who are engaging in their relationship with Jesus. It's saying let's be around people who are 
in and engaging in a personal experience and relationship with Jesus. Get around people who are active in running their own faith race. He's telling us there to make sure we're surrounded by and spending our time with those who are doing it and who are talking to Jesus and not around wasting time with people who aren't doing it but are talking about the ones who are. See, our progress in sanctification, that transformation into the image and likeness of Christ. So our sanctification and our perseverance in our faith Both depend on our being in healthy connection with our local community of faith. And you know the thing about the community of faith is it's not always pleasing and pleasant and comfortable because God will use some of those relationships and interactions as part of our process of maturing. That person who rubs us up the wrong way, it's actually the right way because God needs that part of us rubbed off. So he's using somebody else in his body to just that little bit of friction there. Oh, look, it's gone. That thing that was unhelpful, it's gone. So our first temptation in those relational moments is to want to withdraw. But sometimes we just need to stay there and let God do what he's doing. We are a part of the body and he uses the body to achieve this maturing in our process, in our walk with him. All right, we're nearly there, verse 23 to 26. Having nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, so we won't stick on that for too long. It's just saying, have nothing to do. So as soon as we hear the foolish and ignorant controversies and speculative conversations, have nothing to do with them. Just walk away. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. (laughs) Must not. Be quarrelsome. That doesn't leave a lot of room for interpretation. Must not, must not be quarrelsome. Then it gives us a few things that we can be, we should be. It says kind to everyone. So we should have a gentle disposition towards everybody, using only gentle language towards and with respect to others. We should be able to teach. So not just because uh, we have a great knowledge, but also our temperament. Our nature, able to teach. Why? Because we have a genuine concern. We want to help people grow and and improve. And it's not that we're always trying to show off what we know. It's that we have a heart to see those around us strengthened and enlarged and encouraged. And we want to help them take hold of everything that God has for them. You know, a good teacher, if we're going to be able to teach, a good teacher is able to make plain the mysteries of the Bible. We don't have to make known everything. We, the mysteries of the Bible. You know, anyone can take the simple and make it complicated. But it takes a gift to take the complex and make it simple. And what we're encouraged to do is have such a depth to our knowledge and our understanding of Scripture that we're able to take that which to others is complex and we're able to make it simple. What do we do in that process? We're helping people take hold of it and apply it and we're helping them grow and mature. The next thing is patiently enduring evil. I love the way, I just sometimes wish it said patiently escaping evil and we could get away from it and have nothing to do with it. But it's letting us know there's always going to be evil around. But we need to learn to patiently endure evil now this is written to the believers speaking of the believers so sometimes we're going to experience that evil from within the body but we need to be forgiving not holding grudges not uh, keeping a record of everybody who's offended and upset us but just understanding that maybe God used them in our maturation process and we are better for it so forgiving and moving on and not letting the devil get access to our minds and our hearts because of what somebody did or somebody said or whatever growing up maturing we need to learn to be very patient with sometimes very difficult people it's a challenge but it's part of growing up next thing it says correcting his opponents with gentleness so this doesn't mean everybody who opposes us on every personal issue 
It means correcting the opponents to God's truth, which means we need to know God's truth. We need to understand God's truth. We need to, need to be leading people out of foolish, ignorant controversies uh, because we have this knowledge of God's word and we want to help them grow in their knowledge of God's word. We want to help them grow in their revelation of God. We want to help them transition from dishonorable to honorable so they can also be ready for every good work and engage in good works. Then it says that God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So this means that those that have been corrected, they've seen the truth of God's word, they've turned away from their own immature, selfish view of life, and they've returned to living with God's perspective. Okay, so they have now escaped the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Now they've stepped out of that and they can transition into doing God's will. They're free of all the foolish controversies, the genealogies, the immature and infantile arguments and the pushing of personal agendas and all the babble that it was talked about. They're free of all that. They're out of the devil's grip and now they can grow and mature and become fruitful in the body of Christ. So from all of that, we can see very clearly that the way we conduct ourselves affects a few personal possibilities. So the first thing that it affects, if, if we don't transition from dishonorable to honorable, if we don't go from immature to mature, then it actually it affects the potential or the possibility of the lost being saved. We will see the lost being saved when we grow, when we mature. I mean, in the natural, we know that reproduction is a fruit of maturity. We come of age where we now bodily mature, we're able to reproduce. The same is in spiritual terms. We need to mature and then we can become reproductive. We can see the lost being saved. And we need to understand that that is God's goal for all lost people, that they get saved. The next possibility that our behavior, our conduct affects is the possibility of saved people growing to maturity. So uh, we can help people grow and mature and we can help them uh, stop shipwrecking their own maturation process. We can help them transition from dishonorable to honorable by the way we're conducting ourselves by the way we're interacting with them by the things we're allowing them to say to us and the things we're not allowing them to say with us we, we can help determine whether they grow to maturity or not now we also need to understand that the saved growing to maturity is God's primary goal for all saved people so we've just seen God's goal for lost people is to become saved people and God's goal for saved people is to grow to maturity as saved people. So if we're stopping those things from happening, if, if our conduct is stopping people being saved or stopping saved people from growing to maturity, then we are actually fighting against God's greatest goals for people. I would suggest that it's probably time that we stopped fighting against God's goals and we engage actively in partnering with God's goals. So can I encourage us to partner with God in building a great house? Can we conduct ourselves in such a way that the lost can be reached and that the saved can grow and mature and that the part of the great house that we're in can be a great house? How do we do all that? By starting with ourselves. Make that determination. I am going to transition from immature to mature. I am going to transition from dishonorable to honorable. I am going to go through my isolation, my revelation, my preparation, my maturation, and I'm going to walk in the fullness of my application. I am going to step into everything that God has set me apart for. I'm going to set myself apart from anything that stops that, that hinders that, that holds me back from that. And I'm going to set myself apart to my relationship with Jesus, my learning and growing and walking with Jesus and letting the life of Jesus flow into me so the life of Jesus can flow through me and out of me and reach others. Bless you guys.
Have an awesome week.
embraces waiting dance like the 